All right, guys, we're going to get back on the reproductive system here, and uh, let's talk about what happens when the uh, two reproductive systems get together. Uh, again, if uh, you need to learn about that, uh, please see everybody else in the back of the bus. Uh, long and the short is, though, when, when the, with the sperm and the egg get together, boom, we have fertilization. Okay, and it's, uh, it's usually when the sperm and the ovum meet in the fallopian tube. Uh, despite the millions of sperm that are actually shot out uh, during that time, usually only around 50 get to the egg, and usually one old lucky guy gets in there, and uh, boom, we have a new organism. So it becomes a zygote at that point, and then that zygote progresses into uh, in the fallopian tube and goes towards the uterus. Uh, at the same time, it undergoes progressive cell division. Uh, the zygote contains approximately 32 cells, so and it usually at that point will implant in the uterine wall. Um, so again, usually the, the fertilization takes place somewhere in this generalized area, and again, uh, it will begin to divide, divide, and then it gets into this area where it will implant. Uh, by the way, it can implant anywhere along that area. All right, so again, implantation usually happens about, this is about a seven day for it to actually go down through the fallopian tubes and to attach. Uh, it becomes an embryo blast, a trophoblast. And at that point, it actually starts to form the placenta. So your placenta is the organ that plants in the uterine wall that's your exchange organ between mom and baby, okay? So actually, mom's blood doesn't go actually into the baby. They exchange at that site. Okay, so blood and nutrients or, or oxygen and nutrients are exchanged at, at, that, at the placental level. Uh, usually there's three trimesters. Uh, we, we divide it into three. Usually it's about 36 to 40 weeks of gestation. First 12 is the, uh, again, first trimester. And uh, usually that's where we have a positive test result. That's usually, by the way, a hormonal release that it, it starts to d differentiate different. Uh, that's what it detects in the urine stream. Um, and then you can start to have a palpable uterine fundus at the pubis at about the 12 week mark. So if you're feeling the bump down there, uh, for a pregnant female, well, that's because there you go. Yeah, again, she's got uh, week 12. Uh, so you kind of know where she's at a little bit. Uh, you can actually measure, you can use a measurement technique in order to tell how many weeks the patient actually is. Again, we really don't, we, we kind of guesstimate that in the pre-hospital setting. Uh, audible fetal heart tones are noted with the Doppler ultrasound at about, I'd say, about the 12 leak area uh, is where we can actually hear them without, again, further, without advanced equipment. Uh, again, the gestation of prenatal development, again, uh, is it, stimulated by, the, by some, uh, again, the tropoblast creates hormones that will then, uh, that will luten, it, it stimulates the corpus luten to produce progesterone, and then, again, the normal continuation of the pregnancy happens. In other words, it basically tells the uterine lining, hey, you got to stick around. We actually have a baby now, so keep that going, okay? Uh, the process of fetal development, again, the fertilization of the egg, the first week, again, it moves along the fallopian tubes, and the normal human gestation is 266 days. For some reason, I think you're going to see that. Now, is it exactly 266 days? No, it is not. It can be shorter. It can be longer. Uh, there's a lot of other factors that go along with this, okay? But again, usually that 266 days, it's a, again, 40 weeks is a standard, is what they look for. So again, gestation is the second week of gestation is where the amniotic fluid starts to develop in the amniotic sac. And then the placenta and the membrane start to form around that. And then again, your amniotic sac, is, it's around the amniotic membranes. So that's the protective sac for the baby, okay? Uh, and again, the fluid, they put, a, they put the, the zygote in the fluid there. And what happens is, is it kind of serves as the shock absorber for that. Now, unfortunately, it's starting to grow. And as it continues to grow, unfortunately, uh, everything else starts to grow along with it. And the shock absorber isn't as good as it is it was when the baby's this tiny. Okay. So again, your umbilical cord, that is the connection between the placenta and the fetus. And here's a good picture again of the um of the placental barrier where you're exchanging gas. Remember, you're exchanging gases and nutrients 
via this placental barrier. We worry about this a lot, by the way, with drugs. We want to make sure that we're using drugs and certain drugs, they will cross the placental barrier and cause problems for the fetus, which again causes problems for us. The embryonic period is usually three to eight weeks. That's when all of your major organs begin to develop. Um, then your second trimester is 13 to 27 weeks. That's when your fetal heart tomes become audible with just a, a standard fetoscope. Again, that's uh, uh, the, the little things that they put across the tummy to listen for those. Uh, your female and male uh, external genitalia may be distinguishable via ultrasound. Uh, by the way, that is not 100%. Uh, most of your techs, I will tell you, a good tech can usually pick these out. But every now and then, they, they, they hide them from the tech. So it takes a, a good picture to see it. Third, third trimester. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Third trimester, again, 18 to 40 weeks. Again, it's the, uh, the papillary light reflexes of the phoenix, of the fetus start to happen. And the head actually the, goes into the pelvic inlet. So, and again, at the 40-week mark, you'll have rep, rupture of the, of the membranes, the fetal membranes. And that rupture usually indicates it is time to actually deliver. Uh, the scientists are still uncertain what initiates labor. They're not still not really sure. Uh, there's a lot of things that, that they believe happens, but again, they're not actually 100% sure. Uh, I will tell you this, a couple things that I have found, and I'm not being facetious about this, uh, trauma or stress can definitely start that process prematurely. Um, uh, uh, ironically, a hurricane or, or some sort of, uh, weather event uh, sometimes but that's usually due to the stress of the situation as well so these things can definitely trigger a, a labor action to actually happen now in labor we have three stages our first stage was where the uterine wall begins to thin out uh, the cervix will dilate uh, basically when the, the cervix reaches full dilation which is 10 centimeters in most patients uh, again at that point the baby is ready to be born. Second stage is actually when the baby is born. The third stage is when they when mom expels the placenta. Uh, so there are again and again once they've already passed that nine pound baby boy or girl out of there, the placenta is actually kind of easy to get through. Uh, the placenta, by the way, delivery. Uh, remember for our childbirth stuff, never never pull on the uter, never pour on the uh, cord, never uh, again. The placenta is kind of a uh, leathery not leathery is probably but it's got a tougher membrane to it but it can tear and uh, we want to have a, a full intact delivery which means we don't want to really you know tug or yank on it uh, again the lungs uh, remember that these guys are filled with fluid they are not actually breathing inside they're getting the nutrients from mom okay so it all takes place in the placenta and then the fetus is attached to the placenta by the umbilical cord and again oops sorry wrong direction all right. So again, we remember oxygenated blood comes through the mother's circulation, goes to the placenta, a gas exchange takes place at that point. Fetal waste again is diffused into the mom's bloodstream and eventually is excreted. Um, so again, the blood through the, the the pathway that's taken through the fetus, remember that it's it's changed up. The fetus doesn't have the connection to the lung tissue. It bypasses it. There's a hole, which is the foramen ovale. It's in the left atrium. And again, it's the opening between the atrial walls of the right and left atrium. And then there's also one that goes into the uh, aorta as well, so where it can actually go through those areas, and it doesn't actually go through the lungs, okay? Because again, it's not going to pick up anything. That all changes upon the first breath, guys. The first breath, those, those holes close up, and that's very important to remember, okay? So again... Uh, that's the fetal circulation we just talked about. And again, the blood is it's through the umbilical arteries and the placenta that it carries away the fetal waste. So you actually get blood through the fetal vein and then it goes back through the fetal arteries. Again, the foramen ovale and that other hole between the atria is the ductus arterius. Uh, again, they can close, but sometimes they will close all the way. Sometimes they won't close completely. And again, the blood should no longer, once the baby takes that first breath, once it's delivered, it should no longer flow through the right atrium into the left atrium. That hole should close off. 
If it does not close off, then it causes all kinds of problems. Usually you end up with a hypoxemic baby, uh, the, the quote unquote blue baby. Um, and again, there, it usually has to go in. They have to surgically repair this. Uh, again, vascular changes at birth. Again, there's a decrease in the right atrial pressure. Uh, remember, there's not as much needed now to go back through back over to the placenta. So again, it reduces that amount of pressure from the right vent coming from the right ventricle and the right, and uh, again, it increases the one in the left because now we've gone back to normal circulation where we've closed off those holes. Again, the circulation through the newborn's lungs usually begin again with the first breath. That is usually your event that triggers all of those changes. So it's, again, very important. That's why they really do need to take that first good breath. Let's talk about genetics real quick. Again, uh, genetics is the study of heredity, and heredity is the transmission of characteristics from the parents to their offspring. My guess is, is you're going to see those guys. You're going to see those uh, in the future. So, again, not all of them are observable. Uh, again, there is uh dominant genes or and then there's the recessive genes and and basically the recessive gene theory is is that that they lay dormant until they have another dormant one in which it will come forefront uh uh redheaded people are actually kind of one of those it's not necessarily a, an anomaly but it is a uh, again Usually you don't see people, too many of the, the redheads or the gingers, if you will, but that's because usually that is a recessive trait, okay? And so, again, that when the genes split, uh, sometimes you get more of the, of the dominant features and then others that are recessive, but when the two recessives get together, they help out and they become a dominant trait for a period of time. Um, again, the nucleic acids, we already talked about those just a little bit. Again, DNA, that is the, uh, the complex chemicals that carry the genetic code, where your RNA is what transmits it outside of the, outside of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. Okay. RNA is usually your messenger, if you will. And again, uh, the, the center dogma of life is that DNA. Uh, just remember DNA leads to RNA, which leads to proteins, which leads to cells. So this is the, uh, the hypothesis that Crick actually brought out in, in, in genetic theory and code. It's probably one of the more acceptable ones. Um, again, the body cells contain a, a two sets of genes, 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs. Each sex cell has 23 chromosomes. I would probably remember that little factoid. And remember when they get together, again, the 23 from the ovum, the 23 from the sperm, boom, we have a new organism, Okay. So there is, again, uh, the haploid theories that they were talking about there in, in what we just discussed. Um, again, remember that uh, body cells and sex cells contain two different types of chromosomes, okay? The autosomes that carry genes and then the sex chromosomes, which carry the protein to determine sex. Uh, all eggs, by the way, are they have the one chromosome, X and X. The, the, it's the male that determines the sex because there is two sets of chromosomes there, the X and the Y chromosome. You get an X, you're a female. You get a Y, you're a male. Congratulations. All right. So again, once fertil fertilized, again, the zygote can either have two X chromosomes or an X and a Y, which will then make them a male. That's how we do it. Again, I'm speaking strictly, by the way, of genetics and genetics only on this one. Okay. Uh, and we talked about these already. Um uh, Aliens, these are uh, each single gene contributes one parent of a particular characteristic. Okay. And then this is what I was talking about a little bit earlier about the, the dominant and the recessive traits. Uh, and to not get too deep into this, um, again, it's the very, the veter they usually use a letter value to, to determine these alletes. Uh, I just kind of want you guys to know that, that each gamete carries one of these alleles. Uh, and, and understand that again, uh, the fertilized egg is going to end up with two alleles, one from the from each parent. Okay. Um, again, a dominant trait is either uh, the both the dominant alleles are present in the genotype, or a recessive trait is only one visible uh, uh, phenotype is noted or genotype is noted, and it's composed of two recessive alleles for that particular trait. And, the, and Mendel was actually the one that kind of did some. The major, and he used flowers in which to do that. Uh, and he discovered that uh, with a different generation, it's a lot easier to show you this one. So again, if you put a red and white together, 
again, they they form another flower, which again can form a level, right? Then another one gets in there. But then you'll have one, two, three that are the, the dominant traits. But notice that that fourth one is a white one because it got two recessive genes, one from the parent plant, from the, the, the male part of the plant, one from the female part of the plant. Same thing still goes with that. All right, that's as far as I want to go with the genetic problems. Now, diseases, unfortunately, they can send, the alleles can send things across that would give somebody a a, a genetic disorder, and it, and it can do that. And again, most of these guys, uh, uh, again, genetic diseases, they, they occur because these phenotic, the phenotypic uh, findings, in other words, they're able to find it in a genetic marker. Okay, and that, by the way, is a extremely simplified version of that. Uh, the carrier state, again, is when they, they have a copy uh, of the recessive allele into a, a, a standard. Uh, in other words, they get it through via recessive. This is one of those that it might skip two or three generations before it comes back up. Um, and this was especially true when they found out uh, there was a British... Um, a family line that actually uh, intermarried and one of the problems that they had was they started getting genetic diseases because of the intermarriage the recessive genes became dominant and they became dominant more frequently but again they were trying to breed the perfect specimen which is why they married within families which again causes problems okay um that's what we need to know about genes and genomes and in the pregnancy part so again, uh, make sure, uh, don't go too much into the gene theory part, but definitely know about pregnancy, definitely know about fetal circulation. Make sure you pay attention to that in your book, okay? And uh, we will see you guys on the next one. Take care.